thanks very much to everyone for coming this evening. It's um, it's really nice to see familiar faces and, and these sometimes faces I haven't actually ever met in person, but who've been regularly coming to the to the Zoom talks and are starting to feel like old friends. So uh, a, a warm welcome to uh, old and, and new attendees. My name is Ken Buchanan. If you don't know me already, I'm curator at Gerloff Museum. Then it just remains for me to introduce Adrian Cox, who I'm delighted is joining us this evening from Edinburgh. Adrian works for Historic Environment Scotland as a senior cultural resources advisor. He's an archaeologist with a wide range of interests, and he particularly enjoys uh, working with communities and volunteers and, and tells me that that's his favourite part of his job. So he's really pleased to be joining us tonight. And he's a regular visitor to the Gerlach area as well, at least um, when, when we're allowed to travel. So he's looking forward to getting back to this area and perhaps meeting some of you in person. So I'm going to hand over to Adrian just now. Thanks very much, everybody, for, for inviting me. It's great great to see such a good turnout. And thanks for the lovely welcome, Karen. And thank you, Mark, for helping me with the technology there. Um, my subject tonight, then, is Tantallon Castle. Um, we've done quite a bit of work there recently at Tantallon, um, all sorts of interesting work, which is why it makes a nice case study of a project. I, um, I get involved in all sorts of projects in, in my role as uh, an archaeologist and cultural resources advisor and um, the kind of projects I really love to do are ones that just engage with local communities, local schools, local people and try to do what would make them happy in terms of, of archaeology, try to um, give them something that they'll remember, a good experience, um, whilst also we can, we can learn and research one of the um, properties in care. Um, just, just a quick word about Historic Environment Scotland, um, HES. Um, its role is to investigate and pr promote and protect the historic environment. But as um, many of you will know, there are also 300 odd what we call properties in care, in state care around the country. And um, Tantallon Castle is one of them. And um, it's, um, it's an amazing um, 14th century castle with a beautiful uh, coastal setting. It, um, it perches rather precariously on top of a high promontory overlooking the Forth Estuary and the North Sea, around about two miles east of North Berwick um, and directly facing the Bass Rock. Some of you have heard, have heard of the Bass Rock. Um, it was built in the 1350s by um, William, who was the first Earl of Douglas. Um, and um, he built a stronghold really to celebrate his newfound status as, as the Earl of Douglas um, in 1354. And he'd inherited all of his father's lands at that point, and he'd also inherited those of his uncle, um, the good Sir James Douglas. Um, some of you may have heard of the good Sir James. He was the chap who carried Robert the Bruce's heart into battle um, in in Spain and um, and he was killed in the process but um, forever after he was known as, as the good Sir James so his lands also came to, to William Douglas and um, he built his stronghold provocatively close to Edinburgh um, so he now had a power base um, quite close to the power base of the Royal Stuarts and the Douglas family really became the second perhaps the second most important and powerful uh, noble family in Scotland um, at that point. So Tantallon as you can see from from this photo um, sits on the cliff top this is shown with the tide out um, I've um, I've been down the, the bottom of the cliff, um, having having a look around very carefully, of course, watching make sure the tide doesn't come back in suddenly. But um, looking for evidence of um, activity that is contemporary with the castle, and we've we've done um, surveys of some post holes cut into the rock there, which we think might be the remains of harbours. Um, and you can see just from that photo, actually, it's um, it's a big site and very very open, and it looks apart from the, the castle buildings that you can see, if I can use my uh, cursor, there we go. Um, these areas are, they look um, misleadingly very empty at the moment, but um, uh, as I'm about to show you, they would have been 
bristling with activity when the castle was occupied. So um, let me give you a, a really quick tour around the castle. What we can see on the, the headland there uh, is a huge curtain wall, which is about four meters thick, and it, it cuts off the, the promontory of the headland there. Um, there are three towers uh, projecting from the curtain wall, the one in the middle called the Mid Tower, nice, uh, nice easy name for it. Um, there's, uh, over here is the Douglas Tower. This is the, um, uh, this would have stood 30 meters high, about 100 feet high, and um, would have had seven stories to it. So it's equivalent, the equivalent of maybe a 10 story modern tower block, an enormous structure, which we think would have been um, the, the Lord and Lady's um, private residences. Over on the east side of the castle is the aptly named East Tower, uh, which was the guest accommodation. Um, and um, the, the castle would have had a curtain wall right the way around there, if you can see where I'm taking my cursor. Um, most of it now lost to the sea. So beautiful, beautiful setting and um, just, just waiting for, to have some archaeology done to it. Um, so just from, from uh, looking from another angle, this is from behind the curtain wall. On the landward side, you can see it has um, a complex array of defences. Um, first of all, a rock cut ditch in this area here, uh, right in front of the castle's gatehouse. M more about that in a moment. Um, this we call the outer court. And then there's a variety of outer defences, all cut deeply into the rock, which is uh, you know, an enormous undertaking in itself. If they'd just done that, it would have been amazing, let alone the, the stone castle. Um, and some outer defences, including this triangular feature, which is known as a ravelin, which is an artillery defence. Um, one of the interesting features about Tantalan is that it, um, it shows the adaptation of a defensive site from the medieval, the 14th century, um, at which point people were defending it with bows and arrows, very largely from the wall head uh, and throwing stones and that kind of thing, um, right through to the 16th and 17th century, where you had quite sophisticated gunpowdered artillery defenses. So all of that encapsulated in this one site. Um, and it's all, it's all in care and it's all a scheduled, ancient monument, which means that any archaeology has to have consent, which is which is where I come in to, to do some project design and um, and to justify why we should investigate this this place further. So there's a fair bit of paperwork involved in, in what I'm about to show you. Um, here's another view from from the wall head at Tantalan. Um, you can access all of the wall heads. Um, there are steep stairs that take you up either side of the mid tower onto the battlements, which would have, um, which still have their embrasures for, for guns, uh, small arms fire and larger guns. And um, although it's very beautiful, it's a great place to go and see whether you've got vertigo or not. Um, if you have, <laughs> if you have, you probably come down very, very slowly. And, um, and if you haven't, well, you can just admire the views. There's some lovely coastal views along here that, as you can see here, this is a bay um, to the south of the castle. Um, we know on the headland beyond the bay, there was an early medieval settlement long before the castle was built. Um, several hundred graves were, were excavated there, um, telling us about the earlier history of the locality. Um, looking out to sea, there's the Bass Rock. Um, the Bass Rock is uh, always appears white, and um, and that is because of the the enormous uh, colony of gannets. It's all birds that make it white. Uh, here are the 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 gannets. Gannets are, are really interesting creatures, um, as as you'll know in Gaelic. You know they they fly along the coast and then they suddenly just drop. Um, 30 or 40 meters straight down into the sea to hunt and, and just watching them is, is fascinating. Um, if any of you attempted to go out to the Bass Rock, which is just under one and a half miles off the coast, you can take a small boat. Um, however, the problem, the problem, the downside is, although it's very beautiful, the, um, the gannets will spit at you. <laughs> and they, they actually, um, if small boats go out there, they will um, mob the boats, they'll hover around the boats and they'll spit some kind of horrible gunk and you have to change, change your clothes and so on. And, um, and you're very tempted to jump overboard at that point. So, um, so uh, did I just put you off going? Probably. Um, so it looks out towards the Bass Rock this um, this one of several volcanic crags, 
course, Edinburgh Castle sits on one that uh, run up and down the east coast of Scotland uh, in the Lothians. Um, it's had a, an interesting history itself. It was, it was a hermitage in the eighth century. Um, um, St. Baldred lived there by himself, um, contemplating life, probably staying clear of the gannets. Um, later on, it was, it was used as a prison. And then um, it's, uh, it's still got a sort of partly a prison, partly a sort of fortress on one side of it. It's got some interesting archeology span there. Um, Jacobite uh, rebels were, were imprisoned there at one point. And um, the beginning of the 20th century, a lighthouse was built on the island and um, and would have had a lighthouse keeper, which is, that, that's a lovely job, isn't it? Um, sad to say, it's uh, just operated by remote control now from Edinburgh. That's not nearly as exciting. Um, we've done um, a lot of conservation work on a castle like this. You can imagine a sandstone castle right on the cliffs, exposed to the, the wind and the rain and, and the salty air, um, suffers a lot from physical um, attrition really and um, and we find that the the worst of that is the wind um, literally in the winter it gets sandblasted um, um, one or two of us archaeologists have been sandblasted as well uh, working there and um, so it's um, it's a constant conservation puzzle but very interesting one and um, over the years I've had the role of advising on um, minimal conservation methods trying as far as possible to retain uh, as much of the authentic structure as, as we possibly can so that we can present that to the public uh, rather than making large interventions into the fabric and, and that is is challenging um, so it's it's a nice example of um, and this is this is again one of one of my favorite aspects of the work I do uh, it's a nice example of team working where um, various expertise is brought to bear on on you know sometimes just a single wall or a window um, or a structure as part of a castle like this and um, and we make the best decisions we can uh, and then then we have to to stand by them um, one such um, project was um, at the fore tower of the castle which is this structure here if you can see my cursor there um, the, the mid tower of the castle went through um, a, a number of um, changes. When it was first built, it, it was a sort of grand arched entrance in the 1350s. And then it had a structure called a barbican built at the front of it, which was to um, additionally fortify the entrance. So it's sort of a projecting um, um, gun, gun defense. Uh, um, and um, with also access to the ditch so that um, people could sally forth and and defend the ditch from attackers and then um, after after a siege of Tantalon which I'll, I'll tell you about in a moment um, an extra structure called the four tower was added and that's the structure in the photo here and it seems to have been built um, with um, artillery defense in mind because they chose um, a soft kind of local stone. It's actually, oddly enough, a form of green basalt, um, but a very soft stone. And you can see it is sort of greenish in color and it has red bands of sandstone across it. Very attractive structure. Um, the scaffolding sadly isn't, isn't that attractive, but it's the, way, it's the way to get up to the structure and look at it really, really closely. And um, this is right above the public entrance into the uh, castle and into its courtyard. So of course, um, as this soft stone began to, to weather and crumble, it became a concern. Uh, we didn't want chunks of it falling onto visitors. But the challenge was how to, how to um, repair and consolidate a structure like that whilst um, keeping it as authentic as possible. So I was involved in a team doing that. And you can see some of the results of the work where some of the stone has been replaced, but as little as we could get away with and retaining um, stonework where we could. So this, this picture down the bottom left here is um, showing a close up. And we literally made stone by stone decisions about this. So uh, a really fascinating project. Um, so I regard that as archaeology. That's kind of upstanding archaeology. Down at the bottom of the four tower, if you can imagine just just here where it meets the ditch, um, we weren't at all sure of the profile of the tower as it reached the ground um, because we're trying to sort of reconstruct the form of it. 
how do we do it? Do we put a splay on it? Did it go straight down? Um, how deep were its foundations? So of course, one way to find out is to do um, an archeological trench to one side. Um, so we excavated a small trench to one side and, um, and learned a lot about it. It did have a, sl a slight splay on it, but we also learned um, of a couple of phases of recutting the ditch, which hadn't been evident before. So a very small archeological trench giving us a lot of information, which is, to my mind, that's the perfect kind of archeological intervention. Um, another aspect of, of the work I'm involved in all the time is um, interpretation for the public. And um, so we, I, I work with artists and uh, people who are really, really skilled at, um, at bringing places to life through, through illustrations and modeling, all those sorts of things. This is, um, this is a, a fairly old uh, drawing now done in the 90s, I think. This is where I was first involved at Tantalan. Um, an impression of the uh, inner courtyard. You can see it bustling with people and structures. It's, it's pretty empty today. Um, from the 16th century when, uh, when Mary Queen of Scots visited. Um, I was just going to point out the smoke, which is, um, which is a great way of uh, covering up something that you're not sure about. A nice a little technique there. You can see lots of, um, lots of animals, um, dogs and horses around, and um, more of that later. I'll come back to the animals later. Um, as well as being under siege by archaeologists in the last few years, um, the castle came under siege uh, seriously three times during its history. Um, first of all, by this chap, James IV. Um, the, the owner of Tantallon in 1491, the, the fifth Earl of Douglas, um, made, a, made a pact with Henry VII of England, of course, a treasonable pact, um, prompting um, James to come with his army and um and lay siege to the castle and um he he um called for his his warship um to be brought along the coast to blockade the castle and the the very the very sound of this warship's name must have struck fear into the inhabitants and defenders of the castle so um so the flower turns up to to blockade the castle and um james and his army um proceed to to besiege the castle um and the, the record, the historical record of that event describes him, um, the king playing playing cards and, and gambling um, in the siege camp and um, and spending a little time on board his his, his aptly named ship as well. And, um, but it says nothing about the outcome of the siege. So I think we can conclude from that, that, um, that they weren't successful and they had to retire back to, back to Edinburgh. Um, and then it wasn't long, it was, um, um, 30, 40 years or so uh, until there was another really serious royal siege. Um, remembering that that James, um, um, sorry, that um, the Earl of Tantallon had, had rather annoyed this, the royal Stuarts by building his um, stronghold um, so close to Edinburgh um, and being such a threat uh, to Stuart power. I think that's a, that was a theme for the Douglas family throughout their history, really. So, um, um, the, the, the sixth Earl manages to bring uh, another army to Tantallon, um, James V laying siege to the castle for uh, around about three weeks. And um, by this time, um, the, the occupants of Tantallon had strengthened their defenses. Uh, they had a new, uh, what's called a gun tower, a, a traverse tower. Um, they had cut an extra uh, rock cut ditch across the headland. So, um, James V also uh, laid siege and um, again wasn't successful. Um, of course, um, I, and I think the, one of the reasons that was given was um, that they had forgotten to bring the ammunition for the guns. Now I can sympathize with this, having worked in the civil service for a little while, you know, if you don't fill in the right forms, the, the bullets just don't, don't turn up. So, um, so somebody probably got into, into deep trouble for that siege not working out. However, let's fast forward just a little bit um, to um, 1651 when Tantallon faces its, um, its final siege and its, its major siege. Um, uh, in 1651, um, the Battle of Dunbar had, had just been fought and, and lost by the Scots army. However, um, some um, cavalry, some Scots cavalry known as Moss Troopers had based themselves in Tantallon Castle, which by this time wasn't especially uh, occupied anymore as a noble residence. 
and um, only only about 30 of these moss troopers, but they rode out and harassed um, Cromwell's armies as they came northwards from Berwick to try and um, uh, lay siege uh, to and uh, attack various various Scottish towns. So um, they caused a lot of trouble. So um, General Monk was called upon to um, go and sort them out. And he brought um, uh, a very large number of troops, a lot of guns uh, up from up from Berwick, and um, and they laid siege to the castle. And um, although um, Tantallon was equipped with really quite quite state of the art 16th century um, artillery defenses, it really couldn't cope with this um, mid 17th century bombardment from both flanks. And that um, accounts a lot for the the quite ruinous nature of the um, towers, the Douglas Tower and the East Tower. Probably the, um, the Mid Tower, which is more complete, was probably saved by the existence of the Ravelin, the gun defence, which is right in front of it. So, um, so a long history of, of interesting uh, siege warfare that we, we tried to learn more about through the archaeological investigation. Um, so back on the ground, this is, um, this is the outer close. You can see the Bass Rock in the distance there, the high curtain walls of, of uh, the castle. Um, the outer close has this, this lovely ducat uh, in the middle of it, a 17th century ducat. I have to persuade my colleagues it's, this is a really interesting and lovely, beautiful structure, which it, which it is. Um, um, some of my colleagues are only interested in, in, in earlier things, but it has, um, it has over a thousand nesting boxes for, for dews. And um, is you know it's it's one of the it's, it's a really well preserved um, structure and it's it's um, one of the things that can tell us a lot about 17th century life at the castle and um, what folks would do if they got bored eating gannets um, they could always have pigeon pie so it provided a rather nice alternative um, of course you can also make uh, passable gunpowder out of uh, pigeon droppings so multiple uses, I think. But uh, apart from that, you can see the outer close very, very empty. It doesn't have any structures, any other structures in it. So one of the things we wanted to do was to try and investigate this area a little bit more, see if we could populate it with some of the, um, the earlier structures. So um, I, I commissioned a, a couple of um, really good friends of mine who are based in Orkney and, and um, Alistair and Susan, who um, together form Rose Geophysics. And uh, they did um, a geophysics survey, a very thorough survey across across the whole site. Um, this is Alistair with um, the uh, resistivity equipment, and um, as as you can perhaps see just from from the the, the photo here, it, the mist can come in, the har, the east coast har can roll in, and it can become very chilly, very uh, very inhospitable place in, in the winter. So this was uh, this was actually um, April, I think. That we were doing the, the uh, geophysics, um, and here's one of the results. This is the uh, this is the plot kind of plot that you get from a, a geophysics survey, a resistivity survey. Um, let me just explain a little about resistivity. Um, it is a way of remote sensing buried archaeology, buried features below the ground, and it relies upon a technique of um, uh, sending small electrical signals down into the ground to look at soil moisture differences below the surface with the idea that um, where there is less moisture, for example, a stone surface or a wall, um, you will get high resistance, high resistivity, and where there are very soft deposits, you'll get um, a comparative lack of resistance. So um, the dark areas on the slide there are the um, the areas of relative compaction of hard surfaces of walls perhaps I'm just pointing to one that did turn out to be a wall there and areas of softer more perhaps deeper ground uh, or pits um, various softer features so this is um this is a plot that's better than your average geophysics plot actually shows a lot of features and uh, and when you get your eye in just a little bit you can see very tiny features as well like alignments of, of pits or foundations there you can see some of them across here this is an interesting pattern here so um also some in the inner close beyond beyond the curtain wall there so we wanted to investigate some of those this allowed us to target where we would physically investigate through uh, archaeological investigation, excavation. Um, so in the end, over, over a couple of seasons, we opened altogether 
23 tiny little trenches, um, which um, I, I think of as sort of microsurgery on, on the patient, um, just looking, just opening up trenches of minimal um, dimensions in order to get the most information out of some of these geophysics anomalies that we could see on the plot. So a few in the inner close, some in the outer close, and um, some in the outer defences. And um, I've, I've just got time tonight to try and uh, reveal to you um, a few of the of the interesting ones. Um, what I will say from this plot is that some of the areas that looked like they could be compact hard surfaces did turn out to be floor surfaces and remnants of courtyard surfaces at about a metre depth below the, the uh, well-mown grass of the inner courtyard of the castle. And um, some of the linear features proved uh, to be um, quite surprising. Um, not buildings, as we thought these might be, um, not even rectangular features particularly, but lines of gravel and chalk, um, which I'll come back to later on. Um, so we, um, so I mentioned um, my my love of working with communities. Um, I tried to round up for this for this project uh, just as many uh, people as uh, I could locally. Um, we had um, had a lovely excavation to to offer them, and um, and this was um, and I always find you know archaeological excavation is is um, is a thing of great camaraderie. Uh, it's a, it's a it's a wonderful exercise. You can you can make new friends. Um, uh, most of the time, you make friends. And um, and you generally have a lot of fun. It's great physical exercise. It's great for well-being. So um, got most of my team involved. Um, my pals again from Kirkdale Archaeology, who are a commercial unit um, led by Gordon Ewart, who's incredibly good and experienced archaeologist. Um, friends of North Berwick Museum, who've recently changed their name to the, I think, Coastal Communities Museum um, in North Berwick. Um, they sent volunteers along. We all had a thoroughly good time with them. Um, and Edinburgh Field Archaeology Society uh, couldn't help but join us as well when they found out about this. So we um, we had volunteers from, from those uh, organizations, but also um, people working with us um, from all sorts of different backgrounds. I got in touch with all the community groups, the schools, um, trying to work with with, with various people. Um, we had some, some um, military veterans with us, um, school kids as well. And um, we had volunteers and visitors, um, I always say from, from A to Z, from uh, every part of the world, from uh, Austria, Australia to Zimbabwe, New Zealand. No, that's N, isn't it, rather than Z. But um, lots and lots of people got involved and, and some really, really experienced archeologists who, um, uh, this is Alan Radley work, working away in one of the trenches, and you see how everybody's just watching in awe <laughs> as Alan works. Um, so, just to show you, um, one of the one of the things that we investigated um, in uh, one of the more recent pieces of work was this little trench down here, in the the very outermost part of the site that's in care. Um, there's a sort of linear ditch. And uh, we'd wondered whether whether this was a defensive feature or whether it was um, a siege works. So we put a little trench across it, trench 18. And here is trench 18 in the flesh. Um, very narrow trench that's about a, a meter, a meter and a half in width up and down the banks. And this um, this proved to be to be very interesting. We um, first of all we got some very early evidence from it at its lower levels, um, suggesting prehistoric activity on the site. They were um, residual uh, pieces of worked flint, um, so we we know that there is some uh, something to learn about prehistoric activity on the site. But the trench itself, um, just immediately below below the turf level, as we took the turf off, we found um, a whole series of cut turves immediately underneath it and these um, dated by little pottery fragments and clay pipes etc to right back to the mid 17th century so we had pristine cut turves and if my next slide might show you that in detail yeah there we go um, cut into shape into turf blocks um, lining this ditch um, the photo on the right there shows you how a little firing step was built as well 
So this appears to be the work of the besieging force in 1650-51. During that winter, um, the troops must have been very busy digging this long linear ditch. It's over, over 100 meters in length. Um, they dug it and then they lined it very, very carefully with turf and they built themselves a firing step. There's, there's a, an exit step on the other side of it as well. And it's all perfectly preserved, literally inches below below our feet below the modern turf so that was that was pretty remarkable really it was so well preserved we could record every every aspect of it um, there's our trench half sectioned down to the natural clay um, and um, cut through the turf we could see how it had been stacked um, it was all done probably the prob i'm suspecting they had a manual to do it it was so neatly done um, I, another place, just as an aside, another place I, I do a lot of work is on the Antonine Wall, the Roman frontier across across central Scotland, and uh, the Romans did have a manual of how to build um, turf turf structures, and they cut their turfs to um, exactly the same size every time. Uh, how boring would that be as a job if you were a Roman legionary? Um, but you've got to have something to do. Um, so. Um, they 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 worked they worked at this and it's just absolutely beautifully done. So there we are. It's all reinstated now. Um, we um, we with all of these excavations on on properties and care, we collect the spoil in these crane sacks. Each one holds um, between three quarters of a ton and a ton of spoil. So there's five tons near enough right there, and it all goes back in the trench. We put a layer of terram down and reinstate, and then hopefully you can't see anything within a, a few weeks. Um, everything's recorded, um, individual contexts are recorded and dated and analyzed and sampled. So it's a, it's a proper scientific post excavation process. Um, so moving just inland, just a little bit into the castle's outer court, just to give you a bearing, there's the curtain wall again, uh, the cliffs here and the little ducat in the middle there. Um, to show you a couple of trenches, uh, 19 and 20 in here. Um, this was a long, thin trench, trench 19, which actually had at the very bottom of it some, um, what we think was some prehistoric evidence at some depth. And we didn't go much further into that, leaving that for another day. Um, there we go. This, this appears to be um, something that could even be of Iron Age date. Um, which we've we've caught as a linear alignment. Um, I'll move on to 20. Um, trench 20 contained uh, a larger structure which was um, which had been altered several times like a stone floor and within it there were two thresholds one here and another one here of a stone building. Um, this would have been at, uh, at the side of a door, like a big door check with a large door running across here. Um, and then this was built as a later phase where they realigned the building a little bit. It runs um, almost exactly east-west and parallel to the curtain wall of the castle. And uh, we'd been wondering, as, as you do, um, whether the castle had a, a chapel within it or whether this might have been the remains of a chapel in the outer close, in the outer uh, court. Seems to have been a very fine building. Um, there we go. Uh, that's what it, it looks like in practice. Lots of this um, powdered debris as well. This is all real um, stone, we thought, stonemasonry chippings from building uh, quite a fine structure. Some of these are very nicely worked dashlar blocks as well. So um, we found quite a, a significant building, perhaps um, just above the, the cliffs and just outside the curtain wall in the outer close of the castle. Um, you know, whether it was a chapel, we don't know. That's just based on the east-west alignment, but um, some sort of rather nice building. And then um, subsequently, the later evidence of these, these structures that we, we discovered in the outer court was that they were all um, demolished and leveled um, very, very thoroughly. And what that appears to be is that these were earlier medieval structures, say 14th and 15th century structures. Um, when the castle was besieged by um, artillery, they're very suddenly leveled and um, there are gun positions set up in the outer court and they would have fired across uh, this area. So that's why you needed level ground. So we think the castle's defenders 
knocked everything down in the outskirts of the castle and then would have uh, very carefully fired over the top of it. Firing lines, of course, extremely um, important when, when you look at it, when you survey the ground, when you look at the lines of sight, they would have had very important in defending um, a large area like this from uh, attack. There's another view of that trench. Beautifully done. Um, we, we couldn't have done um, anywhere near as much work as we did without all of these volunteers involved. It would have been just me <laughs> uh, and Gordon. So um, we, uh, we, did, we did a lot of work, covered a lot of ground. Um, moving into the inner court, this is one of our trenches uh, designed to look at a floor surface, um, which we, uh, we investigated up against a, a curtain, the inner curtain wall. Um, I'll show you more of that in a moment. Uh, recording all of the contexts, lots of little contexts of cuts and different deposits. Um, half of these were caused by bunny rabbits um, burrowing into the the soft the soft ground uh, above the uh, court the courtyard surface, which is down there about a meter down. And so um, lots of little rabbit burrows, very carefully recorded. Thank you, rabbits. Um, this is another feature. Um, which is in the outer court. And uh, again, really just it, right below the surface. These are again, um, turves, huge blocks of turf, um, cut into fairly regular shapes, although they look a bit ir irregular there. Uh, these are all individual cut blocks. And um, that's the, the plan of the trench. You can sort of see the individual turf, turf cut blocks there. Um, the uh, shaded areas in there where we've shaded it fawny, fawny brown colour are clean sand that was inserted in between the um, the turves. So, so quite unusual. This is in the outer course, outer close of the castle. Um, I'll come back to the, the, the meaning of that in a moment. This is another area that we wanted to investigate um, in the on the inside face of the curtain wall in the inner close of the castle. Um, here's one of the big steps. Uh, stairways up to the top of the battlements, etc., um, are all these um, all these joist pockets and uh, beam slots and uh, evidence of roof lines across here. Quite a complex of this. Um, fortunately, Kirkdale Archaeology are very very good at um, building analysis uh, of, of medieval structures, and uh, we set them to work at um, trying to record how many structures were involved in this this clear pattern of beam slots. And um, they came up with three, three main phases. So uh, we had different, different roof lines at different uh, times. Um, you can see how this upper level of roof line, for example, would have blocked off these, these small windows lighting the interior of the, of the wall, intramural spaces inside the wall head there. Um, so there was one which was terminated by this, this uh, wall here, a large single building um, which came up to full height. Um, and there were other then phases of lean to structures out here. And the reason they, um, the reason they would have done this is because um, in 1528, uh, after the 1528 siege, the, uh, the owners of Tantalan decided to fortify their castle by blocking up the spaces in the, um, in this four foot thick curtain wall. So they filled them up with rubble and uh, that meant that they didn't have any sort of intramural chambers anymore. So they built a, an ancillary structure inside, a lean-to structure inside their courtyard and um, would have used it for um, military purposes, probably storing um, weapons and ammunition. So um, we know from an inventory of the castle in the mid 16th century that there was a munitions house and we like to think that perhaps this was the munitions house here in the courtyard. Um, there we go, three, three phases, three principal phases of buildings, a very large building here, um, and uh, a series of smaller phases which were simply uh, demolished to make way for this uh, final phase of structure here. So a um, bit of upstanding archaeology for you there, standing building recording. Um, back to that, um, turf arrangement in the in the inner courtyard here. In the um, 16th century, probably about the mid 16th century, this range, which had been a hall range attached to the Douglas Tower, becomes a house. Um, it's um, consistent with the change in fashion in the, from the medieval period into the early post-medieval period, where people wanted more luxury, more space, 
um, instead of having a, a drafty hall, drafty cellars, living in a tall drafty tower, um, they made their, their great hall into a very, very comfortable um, two-story house. And um, in the twilight of the castle's history, it was occupied by um, the last surviving um, Douglas residents, two elderly ladies who would have overlooked this um, this area of the inner in courtyard, lovely views, and of course out to sea as well. And we think that, um, that the trenches that we have here um, reveal part of what we call a parterre garden, which is um, uh, an arranged garden, um, very rectilinear, made out of um, gravel and sand pathways and turf banks, and um, so probably a very pretty ornate. Um, garden. They, um, we, we would have had no idea but for the archaeology that this existed in this um, very military kind of space, but it appears to be in a very well laid out um, garden. Um, one of the trenches in a previous year we cut across roughly there, if you remember the geophysics plot to try and catch that, and, and just found this, um, this bed of chalk, which was kind of unexpected. But um, um, we postulate that it would have been a garden of around about that size in, in the castle's courtyard, which was great. Interesting features. Um, moving on to the, the ravelin, let's tell you a little bit about the outer defences and how they were how they were set up. Um, I'll just go back one. Um, the triangular ravelin would have been would have been bristling with guns in the um, in the period leading up to Cromwell's siege. So it's basically an embankment, um, a spur, if you like. Um, there's there's a very well preserved one at Eyemouth, just along uh, the coast from um, Berwick upon Tweed, and another one which we identified archaeologically underneath the Esplanade at Edinburgh Castle. Um, all of around that um, early to mid 17th century date. And Tantalans is, is one of those, um, which is, um, all of this is some of the earliest um, Ravelin artillery defence works um, in, in the UK. Um, we analysed all of that archaeologically and uh, cut trenches uh, across it. Um, it was, it proved to be very, very carefully laid out, as I, I mentioned, the, um, the lines of fire out from the castle into the countryside needing to be at very specific angles and very specific levels. We found that the the ravelin was very very regular. It was it was measured to in within and you know an, an inch of its life, and um, and still survives as um, as a, a feature that people can walk around. Oddly enough, you know a lot of a lot of visitors walk uh, all the way th through the castle past the outer defences even right through the castle and they stand on the cliff tops and, and observe the birds, uh, the gannets through through uh, binoculars and then they, they walk back again and we get some feedback from them and they say what, what a lovely place the Bass Rock is and <laughs> seem to entirely, entirely miss the medieval castle. So we've tried to put some new interpretation on the site to, um, to try and highlight all of these different elements that we've uh, discovered in recent years. Also having found the key, the key to the castle. Um, so um, I was just going to tell you a little bit about how, how all that um, archaeological evidence translates into us reinterpreting the site and um, and telling visitors about it. Um, we um, we were managed to develop a whole suite of new interpretation and completely change our thinking on the dating and the functioning of of some of the spaces and and especially these large open spaces in front of the castle. So um, so I worked with interpretation colleagues and artists and we had a look at everything that existed on the site and um, we wondered how we could tell these stories just a little better and um, and this this is quite a sort of a major task to try and to do this and put this in place for maybe the next uh, 10 or 20 years and, and try and get it right. Um, working with um, with uh, people who are very skilled in in making uh, models and illustrations, um, one of one of our artists likes to build a model uh, first of all before before he uh, he does any drawings, which is great because he can then photograph it from different angles and visualize it and get all of the um, the three D the um, perspectives right uh, so we stood we stood on top of the battlements looking out into the countryside wondering how it would feel to be um, uh, besieged in a castle in the 17th century with uh, the, the, the dust coming up from an approaching army 
um, and we we looked at um, how inside the castle some of the drawbridge structures might have operated. Um, again, drawing on the archaeological evidence in the building, um, we had a little trench at the front of the castle which had a stone, a small amount of stone surface like a pathway on it. So we postulated a, a, a different alignment of the entrance at one point. Wanted to show people that. So we had a lot, a lot to say. Um, here's, here are some. Um, early sketches of um, the kinds of new interpretation that we, we set up on the site. And um, if you visit now, it's it's all very much up to date and all based on archaeological evidence, which is um, which is nice because <clears throat> we had very little in the way of um, secure documentary evidence to go on. So the physical evidence has proved um, invaluable, really, on the site. Um, needless to say, uh, archaeologists have to get involved when we're also digging a small hole to put a, a foundation in for a, a new panel or a plinth, something like that. So so uh, everywhere we go, every single um, turf that's lifted, um, we monitor archaeologically and we learn a surprising amount from those. It's like putting together tiny little pieces of a big jigsaw puzzle. And, um, and over the years, uh, we get a lot of information out of them without having damaged the significance of the site. Um, one of the things I do all the time is, um, is, is talk to people about what we find and, um, and um, like to get them involved as well with excavation, with um, cleaning, cleaning objects that come out of the ground, washing pottery, um, doing a little bit of post-ex analysis with us, doing some recording with us. And um, and really just enthusing them about about archaeology and the site, and this this really is my my favourite part of the work. So um, so I I, um, I spend my time trying to trying to do as many guided tours and talks as I can, uh, working very often with with groups of youngsters, uh, local local groups, um, all of that. I always find that that I actually learn as much as they do. I, I learn from just just talking to folks. Um, especially when you you know you're working in an area where um, lots of people know their history of their own area much much better than I might. So um, you learn and and you share knowledge and this is uh, this is actually this is great. You might even meet some some pretty young ladies while you're doing it as well. So it's always worth that. And here's some um, some kids who are after my job I think because they um, they were just getting stuck in with trials. And um, so we encourage youngsters and families to just get involved. Um, and uh, yeah, as you can see, the Bass Rock makes quite decent headwear as well. So um, another thing I was, I was gonna mention, we, we had a bit of fun with this um, because one of the nice things when we're doing an excavation, when we're doing archeology span is to uh, bring it to life, to bring back the people who occupied um, the site that we're excavating. So in this case, um, I had a, contact with a reenactment company called the Erskine Regiment and they do brilliant um, 17th century reenactment re scenarios with with guns and pikes in fact they can be a bit scary um, so you can see them firing a, a, a volley of, uh, of shots at, at the audience um, glad to say they all they all missed um, not really they're just obviously they're just fire blanks but um, they this is this is really exciting it makes a very very loud bang um, but if you thought that was a loud bang, um, wait till you see this little beast, which is, they wheeled this onto the site, and um, and um, the first time they fired it, I tried to get a, a photo of it, and uh, it made such a loud bang that, you know, I, I jumped three feet in the air and nearly dropped my camera, but, so it took a little while to, um, to um, stop shaking and to get back and, um, and take this shot, which was just perfect timing um, just as it fires, but you see what, what, what an enormous um, uh, impact that makes. Um, this, this um, and they also let me have a go with one of the muskets, which was obviously uh, a big mistake, because although, um, although it fires perfectly, you do have to be mindful of health and safety. As you can see, this chap has completely lost his head in, in, uh, in firing the gun, not only kidding. So, um, yeah, just absolutely. I, I was just full time occupied as well as as well as digging um, with just showing people around and trying to explain to people what we were doing. Um, and uh, here's, here's a, a group of kids locally uh, came along to learn and then and then help as well. Um, so that's 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 the end of my my slides. Thank you all for 
for listening to to that. Um, hope I've tried to bring to life um, what a, it's fairly typical, well, not typical, but one of the more exciting uh, types of archaeological projects um, we do um, looks like and, and where it can lead us uh, into hopefully uh, lots of extra knowledge about a property and also giving people um, lots of fun, enjoyment, hopefully memorable experiences. Certainly I, I find it that way. Um, I've been doing this kind of thing for 36 years now, um, since the mid 1980s. And um, um, certainly, you know, I've, I've always enjoyed that, that kind of archeological work. Um, so um, thanks all for listening. I'm, I'm happy to uh, minimize my screen again. And if there's any questions, happy to try and answer them, unless they're difficult ones. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Edgy, and that was indeed a very engaging. I'm still chortling about the man with the missing head. <laughs> I'm also slightly um, jealous that you were allowed to fire a musket. I actually have a gun license for the museum here. But oh, right, so well done. Yes. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I, th I was told when I when I um, when I was given a go, Karen. You know, they put this musket in my hand, mm -hmm. and uh, th this chap who was very expert in these things told me, "Well, it'll light the fire, and it'll make a bang, and you just got to hold on to it tightly. A bit of a kick to it, or it'll blow your hand off if you're not lucky." So, um, fortunately, <laughs> it was the former. Yeah, yeah, it was great fun though. Good. So, um, we we have some questions, <clears throat> I think, in the chat, which Mark. Um, can can perhaps read out for us but if anyone would also like to ask a question out loud please do go ahead um is there is there a way to raise your hand mark really um, mine <laughs> just talk marilyn that's that's a good way to raise your hand yes. hello hello marion this isn't a question it, it's a statement to say that i've twice stayed at north berwick and looked across at the castle and now uh, i yes. Now I wished I'd, I'd visited. Um, the second thing is that in reading Hilary Mantel's Mirror and the Light, I become interested in Margaret Tudor, who married a Douglas. That that's right, that's right. Yes. James, James the Fourth, then Douglas. Yes. Um, uh, you can see how it can become complicated, can't you, between the Stuarts her, and the Douglases when that happens. Her children were Darnley and Mary, Queen of Scots. But my question is, um, do you know the rate of erosion of those cliffs? Um, we know from artist's drawings, historical drawings, that, that some material has been lost down the cliffs and the cliff faces are actually fairly soft in places. It's a mixture of geology, but a lot of it is sandstone. Some mm -hmm. of it is, is um, these, these basalt deposits and, um, and, and some of it is, is quite unstable. We don't know the exact rate. We do. We do measure the impact on the buildings. We're always um, looking at the buildings to see if we can detect um, any movement uh, of those buildings, especially where they're close to the cliff edge. And we put little markers on them, and then we survey them with uh, laser scanning. And so we're we're constantly mindful that we might lose elements of them and to record them as as well as we possibly can before losing anything. Fortunately, I mean in the um, uh, 15 or so years I've been involved with Tantal and a bit longer than perhaps um, nothing's been lost to the sea so it's kind of a long-term process but we do monitor it very carefully. I think those the the the, the model and then the drawings are absolutely lovely. So they yeah it's, it's great great fun to work on. Yes thank you very yeah. much. Thank you thanks. Concerning erosion yeah, are there any plans maybe to do something to prevent further erosion so that uh, not that someday more of the castle disappears? Well, um, we don't, we think through this um, recording work that we're constantly doing, Tantalan isn't um, imminently threatened, if you, if you know what I mean. Um, some sites around the country, we, we've got um, uh, one or two sites in, in the Orkneys and um, uh, where else? Dumfries and Galloway, the, some sites are seriously threatened by sea level rise and, and coastal erosion, increasing storm activity. So um, we, we're constantly looking at this whole question of climate change resilience and where we might need to uh, build defences, for example. 
or, or where we might just have to do rescue archaeology before um, structures are lost to the sea. We're um, we're always on the case with that, and it's it's very very relevant these days, isn't it? You know that we have to think about um, the the impacts of increasing climate change. Um, Tantalan itself. Um, Thinking what we we could do to consolidate the cliffs, it would be it would be very expensive and difficult work to do. Um, fortunately, the the towers and the major structures we don't think are at imminent risk anyway. But um, I wouldn't stand underneath them for too long. <laughs> I have been down there, and we've seen we've seen how fragments have fallen off in the past. Uh, but luckily, we sort of well well knocked around by the sea now, so nothing nothing uh, imminent. Hopefully, I'm crossing my fingers. Speaking with the Good question. Time. Thanks. Adrian, um, Linda's asking if there is any evidence been found of an entrance from the, the shore, from the sea side. Um, yeah, um, well, the castle, I, I, I didn't show it in the slides, but um, the castle has a sea gate, which, is, uh, which was part of the inner courtyard, which um, would have been a, a sort of building right, right above the cliffs, which would have had um, a crane structure on it for lifting things from the base of the cliffs. And um, the, um, if you remember the, one of the first shots I showed uh, of the um, when the tide was out, um, we think we found the remains of a harbour where shallow draft boats could be pulled up close to the castle and then materials can be lifted up uh, to, the, to the castle into the inner courtyard. So it could be supplied from the sea and fortified from the sea. Which is um, which is great. A bit a bit like um, St Andrew's Castle probably could, um, if you can fortify the the landward access, um, and then supply it from the sea. You have a pretty good means of defence if you're under siege. Okay. Hi Molly. Hi there. Hi yeah. I like your gloves. <laughs> and then there's another question here from Neil, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. About. He's asking what, why the ditch would have been lined with the turves. Well, it, it seems a little bit over the top, doesn't it? Um, if you're besieging a castle and, um, you know, and all you need is a, is a nice ditch. First of all, you've got to cut yourself a ditch to give yourself some cover from defending artillery fire. Um, so you dig in, basically. Um, but um, yeah, they, they lined it beautifully with turf. So they obviously cut the turves. They've um, very, very carefully lined it, built their firing steps really carefully. So, you know, maybe we can just admire their, um, their tidiness and their professionalism in doing things properly. As I say, it's almost like they had a manual and this is how you build a, a siege ditch and this is how you besiege a castle. So, um, so they did it perfectly um, to put, put ourselves- were they? Yeah, were, were, um, not that long um, because because they had very they were basically you know Cromwell's army were were the model army of the time and um, their artillery was was um, top top notch so um, it didn't take them too long to um, you know pound the towers and uh, and there were only around about um, in the end there were about. 80 to 90 people defending against an army of maybe a couple of thousand. So, you know, they didn't hold out for too long, sadly. Well, I think that answers perhaps the last question from Shelter Morton, who, who is a Douglas himself. He's interested in whether the castle was ever lost to siege. Uh, ever what? Sorry. Lost uh, to siege. Ever. ever. Um, oh, well, uh, only, in, only in that last instance in 1650, um, Cromwell's army then then um, well they would have achieved their objective they didn't they didn't take the castle in terms of moving into it um, but they they flushed out the um, the in their terms bandits but you know we, we might say moss troopers the cavalry who were um, causing problems to their the uh, English troop supply lines so um, they achieved their objective uh, causing a lot of damage in the process um, the one time when it did change hands um, away from the Douglases and into into royal hands was done by negotiation rather than siege, which was obviously the way the way they should have done it in the first place. Um, so it did become a royal castle in the in the middle 16th century for for a time, and lots of repair works were done during that period. Hmm. I saw some. Sorry. No, I was just going to ask if sorry, there are any questions um, from the the floor. Yes. Um, Mr. Barlow, you need to unmute, please. 
I can see your lips moving, but I can't hear you. <laughs> That's it. There's another one maybe intervening. Did we did we catch this one about where does the name Tantalan originate from? That's um that's a good question. And I've I've I must admit I've never found a very satisfactory answer. The one one theory that I've heard is that um Tantalan is is from the Scots word for um a knife scabbard. So it's something that is protective. And I suppose if you think about in um, the structure of the castle, it's, it's, like, it's like a protective shield for the headland in a way. And I wonder if it, it might be related to that. Um, I'm, not, I'm not gonna vote or not vote for that one really. It's, uh, you know, uh, the, the jury's out on it really, but um, that's one interpretation I've heard. Yes, Liz, C can you unmute yourself before you, before you ask. That better? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Talking to the Douglases, there's a place near where I live in Spain, down in the south of Spain, called Teba. And All right, yeah. every year, well, before, before the pandemic, of course, but they had a Douglas day every spring. And people called Douglas and uh, pipe bands and all sort came because that was where there was a battle. Because the good Sir James uh, brought uh, Bruce's heart to go into the Crusades. And I think uh, it go rumor goes that he lost the heart at Tabor yeah. because he right, threw it yes. ahead of him. And that was the lead on brave heart. That's, that's it. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Liz, for reminding us of that story. Well, that's great that it's local to you. It's, uh, I'm, re I'm really pleased that they, they, they celebrate that. that. That's a lovely story. I, I, um, I also sometimes tell people that the end of that story where Bruce's heart ended up, which is Melrose Abbey, of course, yeah. where it's buried. Um, so I often get, show people around Melrose and tell, tell the other end of that story. But that's lovely to hear that. Thank you. Um, okay. We have Time just one more question from the gentleman in the chat shirt who has now managed to unmute himself. Right. Now I was just wondering how many people it took for how long to build a structure like this in 1350. Well, yes, good, good question. Don't don't really know exactly the answer. Um, we, we know, of course, I mean, they had they only had ropes and pulleys and um, some wooden scaffolding. And actually, um, we have found evidence of of the wooden scaffolding itself. So we know that's how they did it. Um, lot a lot of people, a lot of time, and and you know, only only wealthy individuals could afford to command that sort of human resource to to build a castle like this. If you're going to build something that has walls you know over 20 meters high and four foot thick um where there was nothing before let, let alone quarrying the stone you know it's a it's a really major undertaking all that we can say is that um it was built between the years of 1354 when james inherited the the sorry william inherited the land and um 1358 um when he would have moved in, you know, we know it was habitable by 1358. So, so you know, a big project, a big engineering project. These castles are are amazing in that way that the scale of them is is hugely impressive. Um, but um, yeah, and and even quarrying the the stone with uh, basically by hand, um, you know, is is impressive too. Local people. Yes, well, well, um, along with the castle, um, um, William would have um, controlled, um, well, it would have fallen into his ownership, the whole of the barony of North Berwick. So the town existed at that time. Um, local farmers were probably his tenants. Um, so he, he, by coercion or, or whatever, he would have um, been able to command quite a force of people to do that for him, to build his house for him, which is which is rather nice. We can only dream <laughs> of that. Um, and another site I, I, I deal with um, is Glasgow Cathedral, which is, uh, if, you know, is, is even more impressive. It's massive, massive scale. And all of that stone was quarried out of what is now um, Queen Street Station. So... Um, you know, there you go. That's an amazing amount of work goes into these big structures.
Yeah, it's been absolutely fascinating, Adrian. Um, I think we're, we're, we're reaching the end of our evening together, unfortunately, but um, yes, I'd really appreciate it if everyone could uh, join me in a little virtual uh, round of applause, probably a silent Thanks. one since everyone's muted. <laughs> But, Thank uh, you very much, Karen. Thanks, everybody. Very much appreciated. Thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. It's great to see you, and particularly to Adrian for such a great presentation. Thanks. Thanks very much, everyone, and thanks. Thanks for your. Uh, thanks for sticking with me and for your interesting questions. Great. Great to meet you all, even if it was virtually. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, and good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.